Welcome to this lesson on requesting market data in the Trader Workstation API. In this video, we'll be highlighting the requirements for requesting market data, how to request delayed data, how to request live market data, and how to request historical data. Please note that these are the most popular methods of requesting market data. However, Interactive Brokers also offers tick data, histogram data, and market depth. Let's begin by discussing market data subscriptions. In order for clients to subscribe to market data, users must have a funded IBKR account for at least 500 USD in most cases. There are some instances where this is not the case. However, for the average individual and interactive brokers, $500 USD is the minimum. This threshold must be maintained in addition to the cost of any subscriptions held in the account. For those with a long-time IBKR Pro account, you may have observed that some instruments return market data to your trader workstation for free by default. This is because some market data can be provided to users for free while on-platform. On-platform simply means that users are observing data directly displayed through one of Interactive Broker's platforms. Exchanges consider API functionality to be off-platform and as a result, typically have a cost affiliated with them to receive market data. Some of the most popular market data subscriptions for API use are listed in the API documentation for market data on IPKR campus. Users can subscribe to market data through the client portal. It is also worth clarifying that market data is affiliated on a per user basis. Many clients will run a single trader workstation instance for monitoring trades. However, it is common to have a separate machine running your trading algorithm on IB Gateway hosted on a virtual machine elsewhere. In order for both of these platforms to retrieve market data, each live user consuming market data would need to subscribe to data separately. With the subscription discussion out of the way, we could start to dive into the actual API request. Please note that we will be using the same framework from our Essential Components video, so if there are any questions on the initial structure of this video, please be sure to review that lesson first. The most popular way of requesting and viewing data in the API would be with eClient.RecMarketData method, which requests the same data available in TWS Watchlist. Clients that do not have a market data subscription for instruments can often request 15-minute delayed data. This is only a single extra step compared to standard market data subscriptions, so I will include it below before moving forward. To clarify, if your request will be live or delayed, users simply need to call the app.recMarketDataType function. The only arguments this takes is the type of data to retrieve, which can be 1, 2, 3, or 4 for live, frozen, delayed, or delayed frozen respectively. Frozen data will refer to market data from the most recent close, while delayed frozen data will return yesterday's closing values. And then, as we've mentioned, standard delayed data will return 15-minute delayed data. If I am subscribed to market data on a given instrument, but request delayed market data, live data will still be returned. Interactive brokers will always try to provide the most up-to-date market data whenever possible. Now, let's start building out our request for streaming data. We will be focused on requesting price and size data. However, the rec market data request can also return string, news, generic, and even Greek values, depending on the tick types requested. From within our test app class, let's start defining one of our tick functions, tick price. This will handle all returning values related to price values. Tick price takes self, rec ID, tick type, price, and attrib as arguments. While we're already familiar with the first two, the last two are rather self-explanatory. The tick type argument is used to indicate which kind of data is coming in. Each tick type is an integer value that correlates to a specific value, be it bid price, last size, closing price, or otherwise. For a full list of all these tick values, we can look at ticktype.py inside the IB API source files and see exactly what everything is relating to. Users are welcome to reference the returned integer values directly. However, 
the enumerator contains a toString method that converts our tick type integers into the values we see before us. In our file, we can add an import for from ibapi.tickType import tick type enum. This will allow us to reference the tick type enum string method and print our values directly in a moment. I will print out all of these values in an F string, including our reference of tick type enum string. As we discussed before, this would be perfectly fine to print out the price values. However, I also want to see the quantities of our trades affected by this as well. To do this, we will also add the eWrapper.TickSize function to our test app class as well. This function only takes the arguments self, tick type, and size. The sizes returned here will relate to the prices returned in our tick price function and allow us to create a clearer picture of the trades taking place. Now that we have everything in place to receive the data, let's build out our contract object and a request for market data. Leaping off of our prior video, I'll make a request for Apple market data using the symbol, security type, currency, and exchange values. With the contract now set, I can call app.recMarketData to start requesting my streaming data. For arguments, we'll need to pass the rec ID, which we'll use our app.nextID function for. I can pass my contract for the contract object. And then for our next argument, the generic tick list, I will pass in quotes the number 232 as a string so I can receive the mark price from my request. For users looking to request multiple generic ticks, you would simply comma separate the values within the string. So maybe you would pass quote 232 comma 233 comma 234 as an example. The next argument defines if we are requesting a snapshot value. This is a single return instance aggregating the last 11 seconds of trading. If no trading has taken place, this will not return any values. And if we do see a trade in the last 11 seconds, we will see those values returned in aggregate. Similarly, the next argument determines if we're requesting a regulatory snapshot. This is a snapshot used to determine the price of an instrument before executing a trade. Regulatory snapshots will cost approximately one US penny per request until we reach the cost of the affected subscription. If I request market data for Apple repeatedly, interactive brokers will eventually add the subscription to your account as the cost of the regulatory snapshot equates to the value of the subscription anyway. The final argument takes market data options, which is an argument used for internal purposes only. For this argument, we'll just pass an empty list. If we run this script, we'll find an initial flood of data depicting the most recent values for several tick types. Then, over time, we'll receive data for all the live prices and sizes as they come through. Requesting historical data follows a similar pattern to the live market data requests. The one caveat to this is that market data cannot be retrieved if you do not have a valid market data subscription. Before we begin to dig into historical data, I'd like to first find how far back we can request market data. I'll start finding this value using a new Python file. In our new file, I will create a new function in the test app class to define the head timestamp function. This takes three arguments, self, request ID, and the head timestamp string. Within my new function, I will print out my head timestamp value. I will also make a request for self.cancel head timestamp to terminate the request now that I'm done with it, and we can just pass the request ID we received as an argument. With the eWrapper piece out of the way, I will move out of the test app class and create my head timestamp request. I will copy over my same Apple contract I used from the live data script because I want to validate how far back I can find Apple market data. Next, I will make a call to the app.recHeadTimestamp function. This takes an argument for a request ID, which we can use our next ID function, and a contract reference, which will take my myContract object. After these two, I'm now encountering something known as the what to show value. This same value is used to denote what data is displayed in your TWS bar charts. 
In my case, I will use the value for trades, though the full list of what to show values are available in our documentation. The next argument relates to using regular trading hours. A1 will indicate that we want the earliest date within trading hours, while a 0 will request the earliest date outside of trading hours. Finally, we have the format date parameter. This will indicate whether we want 1, a UTC timestamp in a string format, or 2, an epoch timestamp. The latter is an integer representation of the same timestamp. You can consider the former better for human consumption, while the latter is best utilized in a programmatic request structure. I will show these off in just a moment by making two requests. If we run this script using 1 as the date format, we'll see 1980-1212-143000, meaning Apple's trades market data can go as far back as December 12, 1980 at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Before we move on, I'll quickly add another print statement to my head timestamp method for the datetime.datetime.from timestamp function. This will take the integer version of our head timestamp. If I change my original request to use 2 as my date format, I'll print out the original epoch value as well as the Python translated date time, which is automatically converted to my PC's local time in US Central. Now that we know our historical date range, we can start making requests for historical data. You are welcome to use the same file, but for my demonstration, I'll be starting from a fresh example of our standard layout, but add in our Apple contract again. As always, we'll define the eWrapper function inside testApp using def historical data. This function takes an argument for self, rec ID, and bar. We will finish the function by printing out the rec ID and bar values. I will note that we are printing out the full bar object. However, the bar object can be split out, so you may print bar.open for the opening price, bar.close for the closing price, and so on. But just for our presentation here, I'll print the whole thing. Each bar size is returned separately. So for us to know we're done, we should reference the eWrapper function for historical data end. This function takes an argument for self, rec ID, start, and end, and is just meant to indicate that all available data has been returned to the user. The start and end arguments describe the official start and end date ranges for our request. I will create an F string denoting the start and end of our historical data. With the wrapper function set, we'll start our eClient request. To make the request, we'll call the app.recHistoricalData function. This takes 10 total arguments, starting with RecID and contract. The next argument is endDateTime, which takes the value we'd like to end our historical data on. If we leave this as an empty string, the system will assume the current time. Otherwise, you would make a format for year, month, date, followed by the 24-hour timestamp and a time zone. You must pass the time zone for the exchange available through the contract details request, the exact time zone used for your TWS, which is set prior to the home screen, or using UTC time. I will send my request for 2024-05-23 space 16 0 0 Zero, 00 space us slash eastern. Then we'll pass in a duration value, which corresponds to the full interval over which data will be returned. So if I specify 1D, I will receive however many bars in a single day. On the topic of bars, the next argument will take my bar size. In my case, I can pass one hour to receive an hour bar. This means I will receive exactly seven bars for my day, a bit more on that later. Moving forward in our arguments, we'll find more familiar values, like the what to show value we used before, which I'll use trades for once again. Then use RTH and format date, again using one in both cases. Now we have the option for keep up to date, which allows us to build bars as data is available 
and return these new bars to the historical data update function. I'm not interested in this data at the moment, so I'll go ahead and leave this as false for now. Finally, we end with market data options, which I'll again leave as an empty list. Now, if we run this script, I will see my request ID and all of my bar's values. While most of this is self-explanatory, there is a few points I'd like to mention from the programmatic standpoint. You might notice that we sent this request using US Eastern, but my data shows America slash Chicago. That's because I'm choosing to print out my operator time zone, even though I made the request with the instruments time zone. You can modify the time zone returned in TWS by opening the global configuration page and opening the API settings. You'll notice a section for send instrument specific attributes for dual mode clients in. Specifying operator time zone returns your TWS time zone. Instrument time zone returns the time zone for the contract. And UTC is obviously the UTC time zone. The other piece I'd like to mention is the seven bars I had referenced earlier. The date value in the bar references the starting time for the bar. In my case, you can see my bar started at 8.30, America, Chicago, which is when NASDAQ opens for trading Apple. But then we'll see an 0900 as our next bar, meaning our first bar is only 30 minutes long before turning into a series of one hour bars. This is the same behavior as Trader Workstation, though it may not be as commonly understood when pulling data programmatically. Therefore, it's best practice to use the next bar as an indicator of approximate size. This concludes our lesson on market data in the TWS API. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please be sure to review our documentation or leave a comment below this video. We look forward to having you in the next lesson of the TWS API.